About a block southwest of the Golden Apple Dinner Theater is a complex of theaters under the umbrella of the Florida Studio Theater. A dreamer by the name of John Spellman founded Florida Studio Theater in 1973 as a small touring company. When John decided to leave, a young former Oslo actor named Richard Hopkins took over the reins and established a resident program in 1980 in the historic Woman's Club on North Palm Avenue, originally built in 1915. In 1977, the building was scheduled to be demolished, but John Spellman talked Marion McKinnon into buying it, and the reason was romantic. Marion, it seems, had received her first kiss in the building. We're not sure if it was a kiss, but that's what she told us. Uh, I came on board in 1980 as artistic director, and John went on a sabbatical, a leave of absence for one year. And the one thing I wanted to do, uh, because I had been running a touring theater myself for about six years out of Washington, D.C., one of the things I wanted to do was start a resident theater because I wanted to have an audience to talk to. I wanted to enter into a dialogue with an audience that would talk back to me over a period of years. With 500 subscribers, a budget of $140,000, 72 squeaky seats and tin can lights, the theater took flight with six plays. And besides the theaters, now includes an education and touring department that reaches 50,000 children annually, a theater camp, and major new play development. Our first mission statement is to make theater accessible and affordable to as many people as possible. And that means reaching out to children, reaching out to the elderly audiences, reaching out to young audiences, and doing so at a price they can afford. Florida Studio Theater has some of the lowest prices in the country. Florida Studio Theater produces world premieres and contemporary works which have been produced on or off Broadway within the last five years. By focusing on the works of contemporary writers, Florida Studio Theater has been able to offer plays to its audiences that are not normally produced by other area theaters. A perfect example is the 2005 season presentation of Metamorphosis, based on the myths of Ovid, in which the entire stage became a pool of water. He went out walking and with every step the gravel under his feet turned to golden nuggets. Delighted, he put his hand to branches of trees and to flowers, and he had gold branches and flowers. All day long he experimented, almost insane with happiness, that the whole of the world could become his personal treasure. <gasps> Late at night, he stumbled back into the courtyard, laden with precious gold. <laughs> Florida Studio Theater is comprised of five main programs, touring, which takes place in the schools, education, new play development, Keating Main Stage, and Cabaret Club. And the whole idea has remained the same, and that is we're finding new audiences of people who frequently do not go to the theater or normally may not go to the theater. And second, uh, we're finding new ways of working and new ways of speaking to audiences in an environment that is less like a theater and sort of a hybrid between a restaurant and a theater and it harkens back to the old days of cabaret when it started in France in the late 1800s and then took off in Germany. It's a, it's a little rougher form of theater but the relationship is strictly between the actor and the audience. The new play development program is an integral part of Florida Studio Theater and its mission. Florida Studio Theater receives 8,000 new plays a year by adult and child writers. We started the Writer Play program for children because it was my observation that playwrights in America were coming from a singular point of view, which was very much the theater point of view at that particular time, and we needed to broaden the palette of thought through which playwrights were coming to the American stage. So I said to myself, what better way to start than start working with children? So we designed a program that introduces children to theater and then 
encourages them to write plays. Florida Studio Theater is a mix of music, drama, cutting edge plays, affordable ticket prices, and a sense of community that has been a winning combination, and enlisted the loyalty of 9,500 subscribers at the main stage and 7,500 subscribers at the cabaret. I think FST success is based on our very real organic connectedness to the community. That and the fact that we have always been focused on producing new, contemporary, mostly American plays so the audience can relate to what we do. The dream of Florida Studio Theater continues to thrive and is positioned to do so far into the future. Of course, artistic director Richard Hopkins understands fully who ultimately determines the success of any theater. Theater's a great democracy because the audience decides. In the end, they decide. Florida Studio Theater's newest addition, a block away on First Street, is Stage 3, or the Gompertz Theater. The theater building has housed a variety of theater companies through the years. Originally built as the Park 7th Movie House during the land boom of the 1920s, it became a victim of the collapse of the boom and by the 1930s was closed. It remained vacant until 1949 when it reopened as a movie house. In 1950, a dreamer named Stuart Lancaster, son of Hester Ringling Lancaster and grandson of Charles and Edith Ringling, realized a long-standing dream to bring professional equity theater to Sarasota when he established the Palm Tree Playhouse. Lancaster had studied and worked at the Cleveland Playhouse and was technical director at the Lakewood Theater in Cleveland. In December 1950, the Palm Tree Playhouse opened at the American Legion Coliseum at Fruitville Road and Washington Boulevard. The following season, the company moved into the old movie house on First Street. Live theater now replaced the films and the Palm Tree Playhouse had a home. Lancaster's company provided an alternative to the Players Community Theater, employing professional actors along with an apprentice program for budding professionals. What the Palm Tree Playhouse did uh, were plays like Anastasia and the Cane Mutiny Court Martial. And I used to get in a lot of trouble because I was still the director. And I would co go out in the lobby and tell people to go see Anastasia. Uh, but it was brilliant. The Palm Tree Players closed the Palm Tree Playhouse in 1962 due to financial problems. Once again, the theater was dark. The theater remained vacant until the mid-1970s, when the Oslo Stage 2 used it for a few seasons. In the 1980s, it became home of the Siesta Key Actors Theater, SCAT, for one season. SCAT was founded in 1969 under the direction of William Schroeder. It was located at the old out-of-door academy campus on Siesta Key. Comprised of theater professionals, the goal of SCAT was to bring to the stage a cross-section of theatrical literature that would be both challenging and entertaining. Bill would run you through the ringer, but he would get performances uh, from his actors that were just extraordinary. I worked uh, with him on Gla in Glass Menagerie, um, and uh, he liked to pick plays that um, were generally very difficult to do, but uh, very, very exciting theater. With Schroeder's death in 1985, Scat closed. However, his legacy would soon continue when a handful of professional actors, directors, technicians, and theater enthusiasts, including Jack Taylor, Patty O'Berg, and artistic director Peter Ivanov, began a theater company called Theater Works, which would call the theater home until 2003. Some of us had worked together at the Siesta Key Actors Theater with Bill Schroeder. To do theater as Bill had done theater was one of the reasons we wanted to start Theater Works. We found the old Palm Tree Playhouse, which had been used before by SCAT, the Siesta Key Actors Theater, but it was empty at the time and we negotiated and took a lease for a year. It was a black box 
with nothing in it. So we had to build a stage, build the risers, put in seats, put in lighting, dressing rooms, office, box office. Opening in October 1985, their first show, Elephant Man, was an instant success. TW, as it was called, presented five shows every season, fall through spring, and their playbill included dramas, comedies, and musicals. Theatre Works was known as the friendliest theatre in Sarasota. After Jack and Patty left the theatre, it struggled for a few years until its final curtain in 2003. The old theatre building continues to be the home of memories and ghosts of performances past. Bill Schroeder died in 1985, but among the local myths and legends are eyewitness accounts of strange knocks on the door and loud footsteps walking up the stairs, his ghost still haunting a theatre that he loved so much. I was in the theatre again late one night. We would all clean the theatre and clean the bathrooms and get it ready for the next day. That's what the heart and soul of theatre works was. But I heard steps going up towards the theatre. Then I heard the steps going up towards the dressing room. And I walked into the theatre and I could hear the steps continuing up and it was dark. And I started to panic and then I just stopped and I said, Bill, because I knew it was Bill Schroeder, I said, Bill, we're going to do good theater here. You don't have to worry. And then I turned around and I left. <laughs> and I didn't tell people that story, but the sightings kind of died down a little bit then. But I think he was, he was, he was just, he loved theater with his heart and soul too. And I think that was kind of his home for a while. And I think he's still there. In 2003, the theater became the newest addition to Florida Studio Theater's complex, known as the Gompertz Theater. The theater is currently home to FST Productions and provides a venue for other young companies to present their productions, such as the 2005 West Coast Black Theater Troupe presentation of All Night Strut. The West Coast Black Theater Troupe wasn't even a dream when founder and leader Nate Jacobs moved to Sarasota in 1983. An energetic and talented actor, Nate found a lack of diversity both on stage and in the audience. I never saw myself as a founder of a theater company or an, or an artistic director. I just wanted to be an actor and just perform on a platform where I had more opportunity to show my stuff. In 1994, Michael Judson of The Players contacted him with the opportunity to direct a show at The Players. He chose The Amen Corner. That show sold out. It was half white, half black audience. The next show, the following evening, sold out. The next show sold out and the last show sold out. We did four performances. Of course, the door flew open for another show. So I came in and I did A Raisin in the Sun and that went well, and I did the musical Pearly, I did Bubbling Brown Sugar, we did Dream Girls, and all of these were total successes. In 1998, he was set to stage the whiz when the players told him the budget was not there. Still, he continued to have a sense that the black community and performers needed their own venue. His dream was to make that happen. Nate contacted Howard Millman about doing summer shows at the Oslo, while Howard was sympathetic to his cause, he had no budget to add a summer season. He did offer Nate an opportunity to perform with the Oslo Company, which Nate accepted. While performing with the Oslo Theater Company, he had a revelation. And while I was sitting backstage, because I always played a servant or a, a, a slave or whatever in the plays, I was sitting backstage most of the show looking at the monitor, and I said to myself, it's not going to change until you make the change happen. In 1999, he hired a lawyer, incorporated, and convinced the Sarasota Arts Council to assist him in obtaining a nonprofit status. And here I had this incorporation paper and this tax exemption letter, and I was like, okay, where do I go from here? I got a call one day, and uh, a company that was across the street here, across the street from Florida Studio, called TheaterWorks, 
called me in and said, we hear you just formed a theater company and wanted to know if you wanted to come in on Sunday and Monday nights to debut your company. And um, I accepted the opportunity without any actors involved in the company at all, without a show. So I said, well, we have to put something together. Went to New York on a trip and I went to Schoenbaum Library there, uh, the museum, and went up to the library, got information on the Cotton Club, and wrote an original cabaret called Cotton Club Cabaret. And we debuted Sunday and Monday nights at Theater Works, and it just took off, became a total success. It was only to run two weekends, and it was held over four times because it started selling out every show and the community just was a buzz about the company. With the show's success, they were invited to come back the following year. Again, the shows were well received and Nate knew the time had come. A board was created and they applied for and received a grant from the Arts Council. And in 2003, a theater company was born. And then we initiated our first subscription season, which was very exciting for me. And we were legitimately a theater company, I felt, and presented uh, four shows. That year we did uh, Langston Hughes' Black Nativity, Ain't Misbehaving, Five Guys Named Mo, and um, Spunk, Zora Neale Hurston Spunk. They're really very special. They, they're like a shining little, you know, a gem in, in this town, in a town with a lot of talent and a lot of good theater going on. Um, it's just special. It's important because there's a large black population here. It, it, it seems, I mean, I'm no expert on Sarasota, I haven't been here long enough, but it seems like there's a substantial population of color here. And so, so to have them represented in that way, artistically and on stage, is, it's got to be important, and it is. It's, I think it's something that the black community can be very, very proud of, that Sarasota in general should be very proud of. The addition of the West Coast Black Theater Troupe adds a level of diversity to theater offerings previously unavailable in the area. They're providing a venue for performers and an alternative for audiences. They are learning that people really welcome change. They welcome diversity. It makes it all even more so, even more interesting, even more cutting edge for our communities. When Jerry and Terry Finn arrived in Sarasota in 1999, they were disappointed that the curtain closed on the theater season during the summer. I decided that I would take a shot at producing live theater in the summertime. Jerry also felt that the other theaters in town weren't doing the kinds of plays he most enjoys. Those that offer challenging thoughts, emotional responses, plays that would influence his thinking. Agreement by local actors pushed Jerry into making the decision to open the Banyan Theater in 2002. I got a lot of cooperation from some of the professional actors, uh, particularly at the Oslo Theater Company, who by the way were unemployed during the summer and, and welcomed the opportunity uh, to make some money and uh, uh, come off unemployment. The first summer, the fledgling group did Betrayal and Don Juan in Hell, 10 performances of each show. The response was so good that the Finns started putting in a combined 130 hours a week into running the theater and thousands of their own dollars into the budget during the theater's first two years. Knowing that ticket sales cover only 50% of the cost, the Banyan became a 501c3 in 2003 and formed the new Banyan Founders Society for contributors of $1,000 or more. The plays have been staged in the Saner Pavilion at New College and the Oslo's Cook Theater. I was really, I shouldn't say surprised, but uh, uh, heartwarmed by the reception we got from the community in the summertime, particularly because our goal was to produce uh, plays of what we called great literary merit. 
it's kind of stuffy, but I haven't been able to figure out a, a, another way to describe it. Banyan's 2005 season will find its home in the new Glen Ridge Performing Arts Center in Palmer Ranch. What can future audiences expect to find there? Not song or dance or comedy, says Jerry. It's serious theater. And so you've got to be willing to bring that to the theater with you. We promise you that if you do, that you'll take something away with you, something to talk about, something to think about, something perhaps to learn from, and maybe even to change because of. Finish your drawing, Mr. Plowman? Mm-hmm. Well, can't we see it? No, not now. Why not now? I think that Sam is embarrassed to show it in my presence. Why should that put him off? My fellow lodger earns his living in the dubious trade of turning paintings into commodities. In fact, I don't sell paintings. In Holland, I did. I was salesman of the year in Holland. Here in London, I sell etchings, uh, lithographs, and photogravure reproductions. Since 1930, the Dreamers have been performing their magic in Sarasota wherever they could find an audience. The education programs of Florida Studio Theater, the Oslo, the Players, and Sarasota's Visual and Performing Arts program at Booker High School are training young thespians who will, no doubt, answer the call of the grease paint and footlights in the future. The foundation laid by those talented, relentless directors, producers, actors, and angels past and present who dared to follow their dreams has guaranteed a rich and diverse theater experience for Sarasota audiences and those who believe in magic long into the future. moved here I was overwhelmed that every place I went to review a show it was a real theater with real theater seats and lights up in the rafters and sets and the costumes and I was really impressed. Uh, there are times that the community theaters here do shows that are better than what the professional theaters have done. There have been some marvelous performers that have come through this area. Theater has put Sarasota on the map we would not be living in the town we are now living in if it were not for theater. I believe that with all my heart. <laughs>